that. The multimedia view is also in the three little ellipses down there. So if anybody wants to follow along with us as all these events are closed captioned also. So again, my name is Benji Cohen with Minnesota DNR and welcome everybody to our 97th episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. I'd like to greet Madeline Paletta, one of our propagation biologists for Minnesota Muscles. And she's got a really fascinating presentation on muscles. And I learned so much from our little practice session, I'm really looking forward to the rest of it. So thanks for joining us. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Benji. And thank you all for logging on to hear my presentation about restoring Minnesota's muscles. Um, again, my name is Madeline Pleta, and I'm a propagation biologist with the Minnesota DNR. So I'm going to cover four topics um, throughout our conversation today, um, really just covering why muscles are important, why should we care? Why do we think they're really awesome? Uh, where have they gone? And lastly, to discuss what the Minnesota DNR muscle program is doing for these really unique species. So just a reminder, or just a statement to say that I'm gonna focus on our native muscles only. So not the invasive zebra mussel. Um, our native mussels have so many ecological benefits and they're so important. Um, opposed to the more well-known zebra mussels. Um, zebra mussels entered Minnesota in the 1990s um, and they've made substantial changes to the ecosystems that they invade. Um, but I'm only gonna focus on the good guys, um, the mussels that you see here on the left-hand side of your screen, the native ones, the pretty and fun ones. So Minnesota is really unique in that we actually have 51 species of mussels. And um, incidentally, you know, everyone knows where the Mississippi River is. Um, there are 39 species found along the Mississippi River alone. And um, some of the mussels that I'm displaying on the screen here are found in the Mississippi and throughout Minnesota. You can see such beautiful differences between the size, texture, coloration, the, the shell overall shape. Um, some of these mussels have really pretty rays and chevrons um, on their shells. And they have really unique names. My personal favorite is actually in the top right, which is the monkey face, um, or the top left, which is the butterfly. Um, but honestly, when you have names like, like heel splitter or three horned warty back, like just kind of fun to say and really get to learn. So, but why should why should we care? What's so important about them? Um, you know, mussels can be equated to being the aquatic version of a coral reef. The, they provide so many ecological services like capturing, um, capturing particles and then they biodeposit them um, and they recycle nutrients through filtration. So what I mean when I say this is that mussels are always filtering. So they're always cleansing and cleaning our waterways, removing particles like algae and E. coli, other inorganic particles. And because they're constantly siphoning in order to live, they're, they have these cilia inside of their gills that are sorting something that's palatable and they want to consume versus something that's not palatable. And what they do is anything that's unpalatable or something they're not going to consume and go to their gut, they ball up as these little protein packed pellets and they expel them, which then provide other types of food um, for, for other organisms like other macroinvertebrates, which really ties into another important aspect of freshwater mussels is that they create this physical habitat. Um, they provide a structural habitat. You can see from the picture that I'm showing here, we have the mussel with the caddis fly on it and then the snail and the caddis fly and the hydra on the snail. It's just this really beautiful representation of a very intact ecosystem. In addition to habitat, mussels have a muscular foot. Um, if you if you've ever pulled out a live mussel from the river, sometimes when you pull it out, their foot is still down in the substrate. It's almost like this white tongue that's getting pulled into their body. That muscular foot is how they move, yes, but it also helps to aerate the substrate in the riverbed. And it also will help to hold the riverbed in place because you have to think maybe a mussel is the size of your fist. Well, their foot is gonna be double that into the substrate, holding it still. Um, other important factors um, uh, as far as ecological monitoring, they're biological indicators. They are that canary in a coal mine, if you've heard this. So they're a great indicator of water quality and all of these facets combined really create this unique and positive feedback loop 
with the environment from filtering to providing food for macroinvertebrates and then macroinvertebrates come in and minnows come in and fish come in and bigger fish come in so if you've ever fished over a clam bed you know exactly what i'm talking about big fish are normally there so i wanted to kind of highlight um, the filtration power uh, of freshwater mussels so this is a short time lapse video that we did in a control setting just in the lab um, there are two tanks one with mussels in it and one with no mussels, just that broken scuba mask. And this is taking place over four and a half hours of time. And you can see that the mussels were removing all this sediment and algae that we had placed in the tank. And so these videos were running side by side. And so you can really see how much filtering capacity and power that these mussels have. And it's just truly remarkable. Um, and I toss these side images on just to showcase some of the beautiful siphons. Those long, almost finger-like structures, they're called papillae, and those are unique to every mussel. You could equate them to like a mussel fingerprint or the markings on a whale tail, that every individual is different. So now when we're asked what makes mussels fun to study and what drives us to be passionate about working with these blind shellfish, almost rock-like creatures. It's their life cycle. And I hope that you guys um, are able to get just as excited as I am, um, you know, because as a whole, mussels are these primarily stationary animals. Um, they can move some, maybe on the river, you've seen them making little mussel trails. Um, sometimes they just go in circles. And so they need a mechanism in order to disperse and move substantial lengths upstream. And they do that by, quote unquote, hitching a ride on the gills and fins of fishes. And so mussels have evolved this pretty awesome mechanism to attract a host fish. So, um, you can kind of, you'll see that, you know, our mussels are an obligate parasite on all, you know, on a potential for all Minnesota native fishes. Um, the mussel needs to attract a host fish in order to get the larvae on its gills. And they do this by mimicking some type of food source. So just, it's crazy. These blind shellfish mimic a food source to lure in a mussel. Hopefully either that fish is going to strike, consume, swim through this web of larvae, and mussel larvae is called glycidia, um, in order to complete their life cycle. So um, I have some examples along the bottom, and you can see some different infection or attraction mechanisms. From the plain pocketbook, using like a flapping mantle lure, which I have a video of that coming up, to attract a bass, or the winged maple leaf, where it just kind of looks like something white and dead on the bottom of the river, something a catfish may consume. Same with the fragile paper shell. So to talk just a little, touch more a little bit about their life cycle, when a mussel is successfully luring and the host, um, luring at a host, these tiny Pac-Man larvae. So I'm gonna go to this drawing. So we have this luring mussel here. And when their host fish, is attracted, it will rupture the gills and these little Pac-Man like structures essentially then are pulled through the gills of the fish and they react to just the slightest salinity in the fish's blood along their gills and they attach to their gills. At this point, a fish actually, the, the fish encapsulates them. And this is where it gets really cool. It's this caterpillar to a butterfly moment. Um, you have this encapsulated larvae that becomes a free live living juvenile with a muscular foot and a digestive tract when it exists from the fish. And they stay on the fish gills from anywhere between maybe 10 days, upwards of 30, some of them over winter. So you can see, think about how much a fish is gonna move and how it can establish more muscle beds. All right, so now for some more examples, because this is where it starts to get cool. We have the purple warty back on the left that is using larvae, so that glycidia, bound up in a mucus-like white structure. This is just expelled or released from the female in an attempt to attract a catfish. In comparison, on the right-hand side, we have a different method of attraction. This is using a mantle lure. So these blind shellfish have created this luring eye spot to the mantle tail. And it's just remarkable because what's fascinating is that mantle tail actually moves. So I have a few videos coming up 
Um, this one is by Joel Satori. He is a National Geographic photographer. And this is an example of a lure in motion. Um, and this is just one example of a movement that muscles are able to create in order to attract a host fish. You can see from the eye spot, all of the details and the texturing moving. It looks pretty appetizing, right? So now to actually see it in motion. My thesis advisor at Missouri State University, Chris Barnhart, filmed this, um, and it's a bass is about to strike. So, okay, what you see is when that cloud of larvae gets ruptured by the fish, that moment the fish is in shock and hundreds of larvae are wafting through its gills and are hopefully attaching onto the gills. And so this one fish could carry hundreds of new juveniles up or downstream in order to start a new muscle bed. Then this becomes like, wait, wait, don't tell me. Um, this is another mechanism that is super cool and it blows about everybody away. The darter trappers, Eptioblasma. This is a species um, that we have in Minnesota, the federally endangered snuff box mussel. And it's actually one that we produce at our facility. Um, it has a very specific host that it uses, which is the log perch, if you're watching the video. And this log perch is a forager and it flips rocks. And so right before this fish was trapped, you might have noticed that the female muscle was slightly moving and she has a very small lure inside her shell. So when this log perch flips it open, she traps the fish between her shell and then slowly pumps larvae through its gills. It's gonna happen again. Amazingly, this doesn't harm the log perch. Um, they have a thick skull, so <laughs> it's all right. Um, but it's just fascinating to think. And you're like, wow, can this really occur? And so I was really fortunate. A good friend of mine, Tim Lane, his crew was out in, um, in a river in the East Coast. This is not a snuff box in that bottom picture. But they saw a sister species to the snuff box in live time capturing a fish on the riverbed. It's just so cool. Okay, but it doesn't stop there. Um, there is even more methods of attraction. Uh, this is another example, and this is using conglutinate packets that mimic or resemble a type of an insect. This is a Kansas um, Kansas native mussel, the Awachita kidney shell. However, I have um, Minnesota has similar species. I just didn't have as good as photographs. Um, but Minnesota has species that mimic red worms or midges, and so in this case, we have this black fly larvae. And so you can see how they're stacked up in the gills, these conglutinate packets. Here's your little larvae. And here is the black fly larvae, that third photo that, you know, the conglutinate looks very similar to the black fly larvae. So now you're like, well, can I see this in motion? Of course you can. Um, <laughs> these conglutinate packets are so remarkably similar to black flies that darters or minnows, minnows small fish will consume them. Pretty neat. All right. So now that we've kind of covered, I, you know, why I'm passionate about them, why mussels are so fascinating, whether it be their ecological services or just their unique life cycle, um, now it kind of gets into where have they gone? Um, in Minnesota, we have 51 species, but 30 of them are considered species of greatest conservation need. So they're threatened, endangered, special concern. And when you look at the bar graph on the um, side of the screen, you know, they're only second to snails. Nearly 70% of mussels worldwide are imperiled. So next I'm going to discuss several negative impacts that have occurred over time. Um, I want to note that not one impact is necessarily the smoking gun, but rather it's an accumulation of all of them. Remember, um, and I want you to remember as I go through these, how slow growing mussels are. Most mussels do not reach maturity in which they're able to reproduce until they're maybe two or three years old. And with some of them, it's even later in life. So these slow growing creatures are getting kind of these quadruple whammies that I'm going to describe. Also, you know, think about this fish host relationship with mussels and how that could impact um, some of these uh, negative changes that have occurred. So the first kind of whammy I want to talk about is the pearl button industry. Um, this arrived in the late 1800s when a governor, or sorry, whew, when a German button maker arrived to the United States and settled along the Mississippi River in a town called Muscatine, Iowa. 
So he opened up this mother of pearl button factory in 1891, and he was supplied by the rich abundance of thick shelled American pearl mussels from all of the nearby streams and rivers. You know, the, the benefit of the button factory was that it provided nearly 20,000 jobs across the US, cannot be discounted from factory workers to the mussel fishermen that actually remove the mussels from the river, which is pictured here. It supplied a lot of jobs. And in fact, the US factories produced 6 billion buttons that were shipped worldwide, which is roughly valued at $12.5 million dollars. So this kind of reminds me, um, or maybe you've found a jar of buttons in your grandparents' house. Um, and if you have, there's a real high likelihood that some of those were actual pearl buttons that were mixed in there. So also my, my image on the left here is just to show you an example of shells that were before they were pressed for buttons and then after they were cut out or drilled. Um, I know this image is a little blown up, but I wanted to just provide this picture to show you these large barges of mussels that they use to go up and down the river to collect mussels during the warm months. You can see these heaping piles of shells and consider how high these piles are by comparing to the person that's standing on them in the image. It's kind of sad. Then moving on to the next photos, um, you know, all of these mussels were, were pretty old at the point where they were getting sent to the button factory. They needed to be old, large, thick shelled in order to be drilled for buttons. But sometimes even the largest mussels, we've seen remnants of this where only say one single shell, so one half of a mussel was drilled with only one button. And so you can imagine that maybe this five-year-old, 10-year-old mussel actually only produced two buttons and that was it. Um, fortunately, they did use this bent material on things for filling roads, paving houses, sidewalks, etc. Um, and then thankfully, plastic buttons came around and it brought the decline to the Midwestern pearl button industry. However, that opened up the market for a new industry to emerge. So in the 1920s, Japanese pearl culturing farms were actually importing several hundred tons of pearl mussel shells. So the same mussels they used for buttons, they were still harvesting them in order to be cut for an a nuclei to be planted in marine pearl oysters, right? You hear about these cultured pearl oysters. Well, they all needed a nuclei and they found out native freshwater mussels from the Mississippi were perfect for it. So by the 1960s, the pearl shell buttons, or sorry, the mussel pearl shells um, from the Mississippi were a major export. And at its height in 1993, so in 1993, I was, I was at, well, five years old, um, you know, they were still exporting 7,000 tons of shells. And it remained a major source of the nuclei for that curl pulp. <laughs> pearl culturing worldwide, you know, and not to then go backwards from 1993, but there is an article that was shared with us from the Austin Daily Herald in Minnesota, Austin, Minnesota from 1953 that noted that the supply of clams was about exhausted and that one single individual opened up 1200 clams that summer to find one pearl. So, you know, when you think about using mussels as a button, harvesting per pearls, or using their shell as this nuclei, they're all very recent in our history. And that took a major poll on the population. Moving forward uh, or backward, it depends on how you look at it. There's also, by the 1900s, there was severe pollution along the Mississippi River and all rivers throughout Minnesota. They had killed many native fishes and native mussels because then the solution to pollution was dilution. Um, fortunately for us, um, what, you know, water quality has improved. It's been significantly improved over the past decades from the Clean Water Act that was implemented in 1972. And so now urban Mississippi, St. Paul, um, they do support fish and freshwater mussels. However, there's still threats to mussels today. We have increased sedimentation from land use changes, introducing extra sediment to the river and ultimately smothering the mussels. There's one more big threat. I'm just gonna move this polling over. 
there's one more big threat. And the last threat I'm going to discuss is the impacts of dams. So this map that I have in set shows all of the dams in Minnesota with a red dot. Dams negatively impact mussels by preventing them from moving upstream. The poster child um, for mussels and dams are the ebony and elephant ear mussels, which still reside in the St. Croix River. These populations are what I would refer to as living fossils, meaning they have no opportunity to reproduce because their host fish, in example for the ebony shell, is the skipjack herring. The skipjack herring was a migratory fish that would move up and down the Mississippi River from the way down south all the way up to Minnesota. Or if you want to consider another local recent example, um, the Cedar River below Austin, Minnesota has a significantly lower number of species present in comparison to three dams down in Iowa. So three, three dams away in Iowa, there is high populations, high number of species diversity, but they're not going to have the opportunity to recolonize on the Minnesota side of these three dams because there's no opportunity for fish to move upstream. And remember that mussels need to quote unquote, hitch a ride on the gills or fins in order to recolonize. Those small muscular mussels can't make it up dams, let alone fish can't either. All right. So now the aquatic mollusk program, whenever I move to this slide, I honestly think of us as this knight coming in white shiny armor to save the day. And I hope, I hope that we're gonna get there. So the DNR's muscle program has been active for a little over 20 years. Um, the, the research and the activities, um, surveys that we do, and just things have evolved over time, but our activities have always focused on freshwater muscle conservation. And now most recently, we're doing the restoration of actual muscle assemblages. You know, we want to restore muscle populations in Minnesota, aid to that delisting of species. And, and this is really no small task. It takes a lot of work and energy. So we have five major tiers of our program, surveys and monitoring, host fish research, propagation, and then restoration work. And so I'm gonna briefly talk about each one of those aspects with you next. This first aspect, survey monitoring, I kind of lumped together. Um, you know, our program began surveying for mussels in the 1990s, and we've been able to complete surveys nearly across the entire state. Understanding mussel distribution is key to the understanding of our species in Minnesota. You know, they're pretty unique, mussels are unique because they have this hard calcium shell that stays behind when they pass. So completing surveys, throughout the entire state, we can gather information about what was currently there and what was historically there. And so then, um, so all of our survey sites are those black dots. And then we also have these 16 long-term monitoring sites, which are the green triangles. And those are sites that are examined in three-year increments. These locations are monitored to see those changes in it over time. Um, and it's really wonderful to see sites that are improving. Uh, it really gives us hope um, but then, you know, we, we also know it's not that way across the board. So we use all of this information to help make accurate decisions on all things muscles. This is our baseline information. Then we move into the life history research and host identification. So this really started in the early 2000s. Um, and so far, the leading the charge, Bernard Seatman has contributed to identifying 20 species of mussels relating to what their host fish is. You know, knowing these fishes and who serves as a host fish is absolutely imperative because it provides us with more baseline information that we need to continue to the later teals, tiers like propagation, restoration. So now, you know, we're not just studying necessarily what fish goes to what mussel. There's more to it. It's looking in the timing of gravidity. So when they're brooding, when they're uh, when their mom's pregnant, basically, right? What their nocturnal habitats are and what the mechanisms they're using to attract these different hosts. Remember all those amazing mussels and host fish relationship I was talking to you earlier about? That comes from years of research and it's crazy to think that there's still so much we don't know. But there is one super cool thing that came out of our lab and that is um, 
this discovery of the host fish for Cumberlandia montedanta, which is the spectacle case mussel. So Bernard Seatman and our entire lab worked for years to determine this host fish for the spectacle case mussel. This is a federally endangered mussel and it was being researched across the country. I don't mean to pat our own backs, but we did it, we broke this. We tested 584 fish, including mud puppies, crayfish, insects. Um, and then finally, it was kind of like this smoking gun came when they learned about some historical fish lists, which they had used before, but it was the recognition that Brunei and Goldeye were, were once present above the dam, but not later. So then through figuring out how to keep the fish alive, in two years of testing, collecting wild caught moon eye, we were able to successfully identify spectacle case muscle on the gills and it was confirmed. Moon eye and gold eye were the hosts. This was super cool. This gave us even another opportunity to, to learn how to raise this very delicate species in the lab. So this past year, we actually started a culturing study to raise them. And to give us another shout out, we are still the only lab that has successfully kept the host fish alive, collected juvenile mussels from them, and actually raised these babies. So huge accomplishment for us, um, which then kind of moves us into this propagation aspect. So our facility is located in Lake City, Minnesota, and we are raising Minnesota state threatened and endangered species there for reintroduction into selected water bodies. So we're raising these juveniles to reestablish those awesome ecosystem services I discussed in the beginning. So they're gonna make those improvements to habitat, water quality. Um, and, and we all started this in 2016 when we started this more laboratory-based propagation style. And then from 2016 through 2023, I see a mistype on my slide. Um, we've actually produced nine species from three different watersheds. And we do the entire life cycle in our lab, meaning we hold hundreds of native fishes on hand. All of our walleye have been supplied by the Minnesota, our Minnesota-owned DNR fisheries at Waterville or Wyndham, Minnesota. And we maintain these fish. We place larvae on their gills through a water bath. And then the fish are moved into these specialized systems for muscle collection. When muscles drop off the fish's gills, they're about a pinhead in size. So we collect a lot of juveniles and do a lot of counting. Um, but the images, you can see the bottom two on the left are specialized systems that we use for collection. The top photo on the, um, sorry, the bottom two left are specialized systems. The top photo on the right is our culturing systems. All right, so now to show off the cute stuff. Everyone loves that, right? So these are propagated snuff box mussels. That's that darter trapper video that I showed you. And you can see when the mussels drop off the fish on day zero, they're like 250 to 300 microns. So 0.3 millimeters in size. In comparison to 13 weeks later, you can see they're over a millimeter in size. That dark gut that you see, that is our indicator that they're healthy. I mean, it's just incredible. Like, oh, it's cute, right? Look at how much they've grown. Now, we've been busy muscle mamas, I will say that. Um, since starting production in 2016, we've learned so much on what it takes to raise muscles, what type of substrate. Um, and as of this moment, we have 20,700 muscles just from one cohort year of 2022 at camp awaiting to go into their secondary culture. And that doesn't include those spectacle case muscles we did for um, a culturing experience experiment. So then, what we call secondary culture locations are places like the Waterville Fish Hatchery or the Minnesota Zoo. We have 44,000 mussels that are hopefully all surviving and growing like crazy um, over the past few years. So just for an example, I'm gonna work from um, left to right. We have one-year-old muckets in that mason jar. Those are mussels that spent an entire year at our facility and we raised them. Then they were placed into fish um, submerged fish basket at Waterville Fish Hatchery in May. But then in October, we needed to move them to a different pond. So we, this gave us this really unique opportunity to look at them. If you look at the center photo, the picture shows you how much that muscle grew in one summer. This is from May to October. You can see like rings on a tree. We have the time of placement to the time where we just, you know, took the photo. So then fast forward to our last two photos, these were taken um, this past summer in September and where we tagged and actually released them into the Cedar River. So this is the same cohort of mussels, three years in the making for them to get released. 
So when we talk about reintroduction, we so far have reintroduced 1,400 laboratory um, muscles into Three Rivers beginning in 2019. This process is something um, that, that we really take a lot of aspects into account. We use our historical survey data to determine presence absence. We look at host fish research, flow, you know, the normal ecological parameters, substrate flow, water quality, the presence of actual muscles. You know, there's all these things that we need to make sure that ensures our success. And then additionally, we tag and mark every muscle that we propagate. You can see the green tags versus black dot, and the top one is actually a pit tag, which is a passive transponder tag. We're using that as a part of a mark recapture survey to estimate growth and survival. So we can make comparisons among the sites within and among the different rivers, and these results are gonna help guide our management decisions for future reintroduction efforts. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over some of the reintroductions we've done. One is in the Cedar River, working with Mucket and Black Sandshell. We released just under 7,000 um, at these three sites, and we did our first year's monitoring effort. We were able to recapture 40% of those pit tagged mussels, and they had grown 10 to 20 millimeters just in that first year. Similar to the Cannon River, um, we're just releasing muckets there. We released at three sites in 2020 and 2022. We, after our first monitoring, we collected nearly 30% of our recaptured animals, and they had actually grown even more. Um, they were 20 to 30 millimeters larger than the time we had put them out. Our last reintroduction site is the Mississippi River, where we reintroduced Mucket and the federally endangered snuffbox in Higgins Eye. So a little over 5,000 mussels there. Um, we unfortunately were not able to collect monitoring data due to high flows, poor visibility. We're using scuba. It's, it's kind of a difficult situation, but we do have plans to do time searches this coming uh, summer to see what our results will yield. Um, in closing, we could not have done any of this without our funding and supporting partners. Um, propagation and the aspects that I just covered last is 100% funded by the LCCMR Environmental Natural Resources Trust Fund. They started funding us in 2016 and have been the reason why we have been so successful with propagation. Army Corps of Engineers, State Wildlife Grants, Minnesota DOT, they have helped with all of that survey and host research data over the past 20 years and are critical um, partners with us and funding sources. Additionally, we work with the Minnesota Zoo, USGS, U of M, uh, National Park Service. The Cedar Watershed District is near and dear to my heart. They are our rock stars and cheerleaders down there. And also, I want to acknowledge all of the staff um, in the MUSCLE program. This is not something I do by myself. I work with a team of super cool people. Mike Davis, my longtime mentor um, and program consultant. Bernard Seatman is the best MUSCLE researcher you will meet around. Um, Lindsay Ullman, I could not complete any of my work without her. We are work wives, right hand workers, whatever you want to say. Seb Seacrest handles all of the field information, database. Um, and it's just our jack of all trades and then our new program supervisor, Kate Holcomb. So also a special thanks to all of our summer interns that we hire annually um, and our program volunteers. At this point, I will open up the floor to questions. Fantastic. If you didn't learn a little bit about muscles during this presentation, you must have fallen asleep. And I don't know how you do that because you're so passionate about muscles, it really shines through. So it's one of those things that, you know, I remember when I was a kid, Growing up on the Mississippi River, we go out and find shells here and there and find some mussels once in a while, but not a whole lot. But you never really thought a whole lot about them until, you know, some of you like Madeline comes along and shares all the really super fascinating um, life history and stuff of these amazing little creatures. So we had some great questions coming in. Um, Mark asked, did human consumption have an impact on mussel population? Like, um, like for food, I think. Yeah, well, you know, if you think about it from almost like a Native American standpoint, not necessarily taking enough to impact the population, but early, what am I saying? Like early ancestors, Native Americans, there is evidence of them consuming mussels as well as using mussels for tools. And so they were an integral part of um, kind of their lifestyle. Okay. Mary is wondering which mussels are recovering the best, which mussel species now being restored is doing, is still declining in population the most. That's a tough one. It's, you know, I wish it was a one-all, solve-all. 
Um, it really depends on where you are. Uh, for example, there is a site along the Mississippi River in Sturgeon Lake, which is kind of by uh, Treasure Island Resort Casino uh, area. And I was there with our field crews a few years ago, and there was this boom of Trencilla truncata, which is our um, deer toe mussel. And there was also, um, I forget what other species, that it just was it crazy to find all of these young recruiting mussels that are happening, you know, and we know they use drum as a host. And so it's interesting to see like they were recovering, but other species weren't. But then you can go to another side of that aspect and you see places like the Otter Tail River, where zebra mussels are taking a larger hit and species are not doing so well. And I know there's other examples. So it's kind of like a piecemeal situation where it's like this section is doing really good water quality habitat flow is all there and is right for mussels. You know, they're maybe the princess and the pea where it's a little difficult in, you know, but then there's areas where they're not doing so hot. I think it's super fascinating. And you know, I always point out to kids that I'm in classrooms and stuff too, is this has been going on for a lot of years, I think 16 years, the muscle lab's been going on or 20 years, you said? Yeah, well, he started surveys. Mike Davis was the founder father and then in 1989 started doing surveys okay. on the Cannon River. Um, and then we opened up camp to do laboratory based propagation in 2014. But they did have space at the PCA building where Bernard Seatman did a lot of host trial research. And they have, you know, that many years and we have, you said, I think 20 host species you found for 20 mussels and we still have 30 to go before you find out the rest of them. There's so much cool work and research that happens in these things that we're always learning about. It's just fascinating to me. So, mm -hmm. it's a lot of fun to be a part of. Nothing, nothing's boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great part of your job. Yeah. Uh, Mark was wondering do mussels have natural predators? They do. I actually, I, Thank you so much for pointing that out. I did not, uh, I didn't cover that. They are, um, you know, muskrats and um, you think of a, animals, muskrats, raccoons do frequently predate on them and they can take a hit, you know, in a smaller stream that may occur. Um, but there's also, you know, carp or um, sucker fish, they have the teeth mechanisms where they're able, able to chomp small mussels or young mussels. So there are, you know, there are some, whether it be a fish or a mammal. Okay, cool. Um, Mary was wondering, or making a comment, I guess, uh, some years ago, my students and I participated in a muscle census collection movement project in conjunction with pool lowering behind one of Mississippi's lock and dams. Are there opportunities for public to participate in other such activities? Great question. We are currently working on maybe some type of citizen science program. Um, you know, muscles are, we're gaining this steam and we want to keep that going. So we are looking for more opportunities to have citizen science help. We are going to um, soon publish a muscle app that can be used in, you know, if you're fishing or you're just on the river and you want to take a look. So that'll, um, there will be opportunities to help identify muscles in that muscle app and um, I know there's like muscle mania workbooks and stuff that you can get from the state, but this is an area that we, we're going to make better because we want to get you guys more involved. Yeah, just thinking of the, the amount of man hours it would take to do some of the work you do, if we could get some other people involved and volunteers doing some cool stuff could be, it could be really neat. I'm excited for the opportunities you have. Um, Mark had a really good question. I never really thought about this, but I've seen, you know, mussels in lakes up in the Boundary Waters and stuff. How are mussels introduced to lakes that are not connected to a river? This is when I need a phone, Bernard Seatman. Um, <laughs> it's one of those, you know, mussels have been around um, prehistoric times. And so at one point, um, thinking it just historically how mussels were or how rivers and lakes were connected um, thousands, hundreds, thousands of years ago, um, they've been around that long. And so uh, that's kind of where they've been able to evolve some of this host attraction. And sometimes it's very selective on where they're located. So when you think about the boundary waters, at one point it was connected and it's great that's to know that mussels are still thriving up there. 
Great. Uh, Ray was asking again about lake mussels. He knows there's lake mussels in Lake Vermilion, and I fear that they are in danger of being eliminated because of excessive boating activities. Have you guys done any research on lake mussels and I guess more of the popular activities, wakeboarding and, and whatnot in lakes? We haven't. Um, there are mussels in lakes, um, and even the mussels that are found in lakes are actually ones that are still found in our river systems. Um, we predominantly do focus on streams and rivers. Um, we do have a future plan to study some some smaller uh, lakes. I can't think of the exact name of them, uh, just to see what's there. Mussels in lakes do typically, you know, stay in that more shallow portion. They're not necessarily in the deepest point. Um, that's kind of what we found from our surveys. I'm thinking for me personally, surveying around like Lake Billsby or um, a couple quick surveys we did around uh, central Minnesota. So the impacts on those those wake, you know, wake surfing or wakeboarding, we don't necessarily know that. Um, and so I guess I, I can't educationally give you the correct answer for, for what we know. Interesting topic, I guess. Jeff asked, is climate change a threat to mussels? When you look at the larger picture of climate change, I mean, absolutely, because you can consider how that's going to change the amount of rainfall, what it's going to do for temperatures, and how that's going to impact fish and other biota. So, you know, you have this very delicate system and any small change is going to make an impact on all things. Yeah. Uh, John was wondering what impact zebras and quagga mussels have on native species? Yeah, zebra and quagga mussels. So you have Dracaena polymorpha and Dracaena burgensis. Um, those are our two native or invasive species that entered the Minnesota in the 1990s. And they do take an impact on freshwater mussels. You have to, you know, we, anybody that hasn't been living under a rock knows about zebra mussels. And their primary mechanism for ed attaching to objects is through these bissel threads. And so what they do is when they, they're free, free swimming villagers, so they don't require that host fish like native mussels do. They just release their young, they're called villagers, and they drift in the water column until they settle out on a hard substrate. And at that time point, they're moving and trying to find some something hard to settle on, whether that be your boat dock, a rock, a muscle, and then at that point, you can just imagine a muscle getting more and more encapsulated, and they have no response to be able to move necessarily away from zebra mussels because they're rocks, right? The muscle mussels are pretty sedimentary. So when you get enough zebra mussels piled on top of them, you're not only suffocating them, you're competing for food. Um, it's kind of a lose-lose situation for the native guys. Okay. It's interesting. It's you know, fishing up on Mille Lacs and stuff, seeing the zebra mussels in the bottom, is just, it's amazing how fast those things spread and they're just everywhere some places so uh anna was asking how are long-term monitoring sites chosen um, i noticed there are not many monitoring sites in the mississippi headwaters or northeast great question and this is i wish you know this is i phone a friend um my best answer is so these 16 long-term monitoring sites were established um you know, in the early 1990s, and they were looking at populations that, you know, areas that were accessible to us, but then also had a mussel population that we could monitor. The majority speaking of freshwater mussels are kind of found along that Mississippi River Valley. There is still a lot following the Minnesota. Um, and when you think kind of about the, the warmer waters we have in South Central Minnesota. And so that's kind of where they were selected, opposed to going all the way up north, um, where you're in more lake habitat and the water itself um, may not be generally as productive. Um, that's not to say that we're not going to revisit these monitoring sites. There has been discussions for us to, you know, drop some and then add a few different areas. That's interesting. Um, William was asking, um, how have the drought years affected mussel health in populations in Upper Mississippi? Are they able to restock from tributaries or? It's a catch-22. Um, so the negative side of droughts is obviously more exposure, lower water levels, higher temperature, more exposure to desiccation for native mussels. But at the flip side, you have more fish congregated in a tight-knit area that may actually 
can, you know, a, be attracted to the more gravid muscles. So, you know, it ultimately it's not a good thing. Um, but then, you know, we have to try to see the good and all the bad, which is that one positive that maybe more fish are going to be congregated near a muscle bed, dense muscle bed, and then be able to start new muscle beds once the flow goes back to normal. We're getting so many questions, and I don't know if we'll get through them all, but Adrian <laughs> has one that I love, being a, being a fisherman and a fly angler. Um, is there something that anglers can do to be mindful of muscle um, on the gills of fish? I'm thinking specifically with fish that are on that are catching for consumption. It's it's hit or miss with that. You know, we I love fishing. I grew up doing it, um, and uh, it's I never like to think about what I could be doing to native mussels. Um, you know, fish within your respected limits. And uh, when it comes to rough fish, you know, rough fish are just as important to freshwater mussels as as walleye or bass. Um, the freshwater drum is considered to be a host generalist, which means a lot of mussels use it for its gills. So recognizing that all fish are important to mussels is really just going to be more what I would want as the take home message. Um, and so, you know, yes, Minnesota loves their walleye. You can still heat them. Um, they are a great host fish, but there are other options or there are other fish that can work as hosts too. Okay. Uh, Jeff was wondering, are mussels in danger of expiring if they're left high and dry during low river levels? If you come across a mussel high and dry, should you move it? You could, you definitely can. I will never tell you if you see a mussel on shore that you should leave it there. One, a dead mussel smells awful. It's the most rancid thing in the world. But um, definitely, if if you're in a low water event, you don't necessarily have to go out searching for them, though I would applaud you if you do. Um, just toss them back into deeper water. They are able to move, but they're blind shellfish. During a low water lowering, they necessarily don't know where the deeper water is, so they'll keep searching, and you might be able to find those tracks, and um, they'll always appreciate it. Janine mentioned she, she had two questions about the tags, um, how durable they are, do they fall off in water, and then also if you could share more about the app, and you know Janine, you can give her a call about that when you find out more, I guess. But. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the tags, um, you know, if you're in the Cedar, Cannon, or Upper Mississippi and you see a mussel that's tagged, definitely leave it in the water. Um, but the, our tags so far have been really durable. A few people, um, when I was doing my graduate degree, were actually testing them in a rock tumbler um, with some just shelled mussels, not live ones, um, hollowed out ones. And so super glue, just plain old super glue, seems to work really well. We've had great success with it. Um, the pit tags are the ones that do fall off the most because they're the largest. Uh, and we've actually been re-gluing some extra reinforcements when we're doing our marker capture surveys. And then the black dots, or sometimes we'll just scratch through the periostracum, which is the outer coating of a muscle. And um, then we still know it's ours. Is there any, I know with, Fish, if you catch a tagged fish, you can, there's a website, we can go on our, our dnr.gov website and report the tagged fish. Is there something similar coming for mussels or active now? We don't have anything active now. It is an option that we've been talking with our app developers about to do some type of recording. Um, so that way this could be an involvement for a citizen science program. If you're canoeing um, on the Cedar Cannon River, which both are so beautiful, I would recommend doing it even if you're not hunting for mussels. Uh, if you were to come across one, you could record that information, but we don't have those final details worked out yet. That's cool. Uh, Joanne was wondering, I know the Army Corps of Engineers is changing their dredging practices in upper Mississippi to prevent damage to mussels. Could you speak to that a little bit? I wish I could more. That's really not in my wheelhouse um, and not in my knowledge. But, you know, the Corps of Engineers has been one of our biggest partners for the last 20 years um, when they took the Jeopardy decision for the Higgins Eye Muscle. So beginning in the early 2000s, they actually started doing this. So we do I do laboratory based propagation. We did a field based, you know, in the water um, style uh, propagation effort. And we've actually seen successful reintroductions because of that. That was kind of the fuel that gave us, okay, we can ramp this laboratory-based propagation up. So, you know, the Corps of Engineers, we work with biologists there, and it is something that they are very strongly considering. And they're working with us to develop 
you know, those techniques or helping then funding propagation related work or what else we could do to restore those potentially damaged areas. Okay, great. No, we have another, Amanda's asking another volunteer question. So you might have some volunteers calling you. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> She's wondering if you need any volunteers or other agencies in greater Minnesota to assist with muscles. And maybe this is a future thing with the, with the Minnesota volunteer network that we could um, use at some point down the road. So. Yeah, definitely. We, um, I do want to, while I have this platform to welcome anyone to come to see our facility in Lake City, Minnesota. Um, we will talk your ear off about muscles and you can kind of see really what it takes down there. So we, we would appreciate volunteers. Um, there are some survey areas that it makes a little, a little difficult because of scuba diving for field, but we do have then aspects where we're just monitoring in smaller streams where we're just waiting or maybe using snorkeling gear. Um, when Lindsay and I are doing these intensive pit tag uh, monitoring events, we honestly, we take as many people as we can. We've been very fortunate to work with the Cedar Watershed District, the Friends of the Hormel Nature Center, which is a nonprofit nature center in Austin. Um, and we kind of bring out all the guns on those events, but definitely we are open for volunteers. And on our DNR webpage, scroll all the way down to the bottom, um, there will be our staff emails and phone number for everyone and um, all of us. And so you can just always give us a quick email. Great. And just to let people know, the, um, the link for that page is in the chat also. And at the end of this program, when we close out of this, you will be directed to that muscle page in the DNR site too. So. If you forget where to find that, you'll be directed there shortly. So, and join and and I never thought of this. This is a great question. Perhaps you mentioned this, but for those that live in shallow waters, how do they overwinter? So, when you think about rivers that are flowing, a lot of times, um, when it's shallow water and how the water's flowing, say it's over going over a riffle, that's a high flow area, so the water doesn't allow ice to form just because of that constant water movement. And a lot of mussels in the winter just burrow down deeper and deeper into the substrate. A lot of them not, aren't necessarily at the surface anymore. They're kind of hunkered down. They kind of know it's coming so they don't sit on shore, huh? <laughs> and Steven is wondering, is there a, doc, a list or a document of native species showing their host fish species for each of them? At least the ones you know. Yeah, we we don't have something on our website yet. We've had a lot of requests for that, especially internally within the DNR. There's um, an interest or a need. And so we are working on some type of document that outlines all information about Minnesota mussels. Um, hopefully it comes within the next few years. Great. Bill apologizes. He joined the meeting a little bit late. So Bill, this is recorded. You can go back and catch the first part um, after this if you want. but. He was wondering specifically about studying mussels in the Red River system, Red River, Red Lake River and the Clearwater River. You know, if that's a, you can speak on that or he could reach out to you separately for that? Or? Yeah, that's again, it's out of my wheelhouse. I mean, I know a lot about our program, but I was also like one year old when they started it. Um, so if you wanna reach out more specific questions about the Red Lake, Clearwater River, Mike Davis or Bernard Seatman, again, on that website, will be able to answer any of those type of questions. Um, and we got a couple wonderful thank you very much for doing this. Um, Jeff just posted in there, is the Minnesota, is the muscle of Minnesota poster still available from the DNR? Definitely. Sure. Yes. Great. Just contact us. <laughs> and Adrian put a link in here for Illinois. Adrian, if you want to put that in the chat function, if, if you want to share that, we can't link from our questions, but. And this brought up a question I had when you were talking too about other states doing all this muscle research. He put a link in there on fish host from Illinois, it looks like, university. So I, I can't click on the link in the question, but if you put it in the chat, Adrian, people might be able to click on that link. But is there other states? I mean, Minnesota is not the only state that has muscles. Are there other states that are cooperating with this and doing this type of research and propagation like we are? There are. 
Not very many, but there are. Our closest working partner is actually the Genoa National Fish Hatchery. Um, Megan Bradley and Beth Glidewall are the propagation biologists there. And so they are um, Fish and Wildlife Service. They're working predominantly um, actually in the Wisconsin Channel as well as the Mississippi, um, all the way down through like Cordova um, and, and furthering down south. So they do a very, very similar work to what we do and actually we supply juveniles sometimes back and forth to one another because somebody may be propagating something the other one's not and it kind of splits our activities um, but as far as the midwest goes it really just kind of stems to us um, there is a facility in dupage county in illinois that is just a small outfit that's working um, on on dupage county mussels for a stream that's right outside of their um, neighborhood I don't know what you know and then it's kind of varied you split a few facilities are along um, the west coast but the majority of mussel propagation is um, down south Alabama Tennessee Missouri um, and then when you go along the east coast there is a ton of uh, work going on in the Delaware Virginia both North and South Carolina Maine uh, Massachusetts it's it's really cool but um, you know Minnesota's we're our own little Midwest channel with Genoa Great. Um, just looking through the chat here, Adrian, thanks for posting that there. Also, uh, Rick sent me a message asking, what is the largest stressor on our native mussels? Habitat pollution, invasives? An accumulation of all. Um, and, th and that's where it's like, it's not one glove fits all, um, you know, because in some areas, when you look at, you know, the Minnesota River really hasn't rebounded. Um, from its declines and so but that is also has a lot more sedimentation that's going into it opposed to areas um kind of on like the otter tail where i, I think i'm i hopefully i'm not misspeaking when i say otter tail and zebra mussels uh, you know so there's that impact over there opposed to maybe localized pollution um events it, it really it really varies across each stream okay um, you know, one, this one might be out of your wheelhouse too, but it's kind of interesting and when I missed it up here, but it says, she asked, there was an interesting story about muscle restoration in the Washington Post this weekend, described the reintroduction of spiny mussels in the James River in Virginia and stated that the mussels are parasitic and require nutrients from the fish blood. Is that true of Minnesota mussels also? It, it is true. Um, Super cool that you read that in the Washington Post. Um, I worked with James Spiny Muscle prior to moving to Minnesota for this position wow. and starting the program. So super exciting stuff. Um, mussels do, you know, they are an obligate parasite. And a couple researchers, one of them was a Minnesota intern turned PhD student, did her research on to see what genetic markers they were taking from fish. So the mussels do take some nutrients from the fish during that caterpillar to a butterfly glochidia into a free living juvenile, but not enough to harm the fish. They're not a, um, a negative parasite. Um, it's obligate, yes, but not quite symbiosis. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic relationship where the fish isn't harmed and the mussels do receive some benefit. They're not out of your wheelhouse at all. <laughs> <laughs> James River's body muscle. <laughs> So I think we are running out of time. I'm getting a ton of comments in there that, you know, thank you so much. Uh, really, People really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed it. It was wonderful to talk to you again and learn so much about mussels, uh, one of those species that I don't, it's, people just don't, aren't constantly, it's not like walleye either. We don't have a mussel opener. It's not ever on everybody's radar, but they're a super important species to just our natural world and our environment and a lot of other uh, species in the ecosystem. So thank you so much for sharing your time and talents and PowerPoint with us. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you guys so much. Thanks for everybody that joined us. Uh, maybe we'll see you next week. Hope to see you next week. Uh, February 8th, we are talking about burbot, the elusive eel pout fishing. So uh, join us there and learn a little bit more about eel pout. So have a great week, everybody. Stay warm out there and uh, have a fun and safe weekend hopefully out there on the ice, ice fishing or getting outside and enjoying the uh, wonderful weather this weekend.